This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Years ago, a cousin introduced me to Taiwanese bicycling culture during one of my visits back to my parents' homeland. Together, we toured by bike around my father's village in Taiwan through backcountry roads that took us past rice paddies, ruined houses, and Buddhist temples. I could have seen all of these sights from the comforts of a car or at the speed of a moped, but being on a bike let me take in the experiences at my own pace. They also helped me to feel connected to my father, who biked similar roads as an adolescent and student, long before cars were the norm in his village, when all you could rely on were your own two legs, and if you were lucky, a pair of wheels. Bikes were my first medium of knowing and seeing what my body was capable of. Kyleen Wang did the STP, or Seattle to Portland, ride. Those 206 miles proved, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that she could trust in her physical body. That was the first time I ever made, like, a training plan and, like, wow, like, could I actually ride my bike 100 miles in one day? I, this is, like, something I would never fathom. A newcomer to cycling might be dissuaded from jumping into the sport. You'd have to get past the magazine images of hyperfit athletes in spandex engaged in cyclocross, a non-Olympic style of cycling that combines road cycling, mountain biking, and steeplechase. I literally believed I had to do that for some reason in order to be called a cyclist. I know that I'm not your traditional rider, and I've never really believed what my body could do. And so for me to set these long distance goals has been just like really empowering for myself and my body, my abilities. Kyleen didn't see many images of Asian American bike riders in a culture of white men, skin tight spandex and titanium bikes engineered for speed. Andrew Chin also discovered an appreciation for biking, but in a different way. It's a 1983 Schwinn All Sport a bike that my brother got for my dad because it was similar to one that he had in college. My dad didn't really ride it. I took it on as my own because I I figured I would commute to campus and that would be like my main mode of transportation. And I just started working on that bike and taking it apart and figuring out how it worked, make it my own. Being able to like do repairs and like upgrade my bike on my own felt very empowering. Andrew and Kyleen both found a vehicle that carried them somewhere they never expected to travel. Andrew and Kyleen are members of ABC, Ampersand Bike Club. They meet up once a month on an organized community ride with other Asian American Pacific Islander biking enthusiasts. This kind of specifically Asian space wasn't something either had a lot of experience with, but in 2021, it became a necessity. Welcome to 10,000 Things, a podcast about modern artifacts of Asian American life. I'm your host, Shin Yi Pai. Today, the bicycle. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. Hey, my name's Claire McGrain, and I'm a producer for Seattle Now, KUOW's local news podcast. There is a lot happening in our region, and it's a lot of work to keep track of it all. We'll get you caught up on the latest news and take a deep dive into something happening around the city, all in under 15 minutes. Get a morning walk-in or grab a cup of coffee and start your day with us. Learn something new and connect with our city by searching for Seattle Now wherever you get your podcasts. Asian spaces aren't a given. 
For those of us who grew up as some of the only Asians in our neighborhoods and schools, Asian space looked like Chinese school on Saturday mornings, or Asian American church services on Sundays, or family gatherings. For me, growing up in Riverside, California, I experienced Asian space when I grocery shopped with my parents in Monterey Park, which was an hour from our house. We were weekend Asians. The rest of our week was spent assimilating. Kyleen grew up in Houston. Growing up, I've always just never felt like I fitted in with the Asians. My mom was a single mom, and she was never at home because she worked nights. Me and my sister just kind of did things on our own, and I found myself falling into, like, what they call, like, the on-level kids, like, the people that weren't in honor classes. There are a handful of circumscribed stereotypes around what being Asian has to look like, many of them defined by academic performance. These limited stereotypes can be pretty painful to navigate alone. And I would see all of the Asians hanging out together and, like, getting food and just, like, like I just always was that girl that the token Asian girl with all my white friends outside of that. For Andrew, even the connections to Seattle's Chinatown International District, the center of the Asian American community, felt estranged. My grandfather had this big gambling problem. My family in particular moved to Everett specifically to avoid, get away from Chinatown. And so I always felt really isolated from Chinatown. For many of us, we live in between different communities and identities that bring forward different parts of who we are. But sometimes an unexpected event is put in front of us and makes us confront things that we may not have been ready to examine before. On March 16, 2021, a shooting spree took place across three spas in Atlanta. Eight people were killed. Six of the people killed were women of East Asian descent. The youngest victim was 33 while the oldest victim was 74. Some were mothers, others were grandmothers. All died violently. I think I just like got on my bike and started riding around, honestly. As news of the Atlanta spa shootings unfolded in the media, a part of me curled up and died inside. I was working from home for a small art center in a seaside town when the news hit. I asked our marketing director if we could put out a statement on social media, like they had after George Floyd. She asked if I really thought we needed one. A co-worker held back from checking in on me because our executive director had explicitly ordered her not to mention the shootings to me. Later, that same director would talk my ear off about how she had no idea that Asians were targets of bias and hate. No one wanted to publicly condemn the violence enacted against Asian women as a hate crime. On top of that, the shooting suspect defended himself with a claim that he had a sexual addiction. The act of shooting six Asian women was justified as an act of eradicating temptation, the reminder of sin. The logic of the moment completely failed all Asian women, erasing us and rendering our lives worthless in an instant. Kyleen, too, was stunned. The whole Atlanta spa shootings, like, literally flipped my world upside down. It just started hitting me like rocks or something. It's not just, like, the shootings, you know, but unraveling my entire, like, life as an Asian woman. The pandemic brought anti-Asian racism and hate to the fore. Blamed for the spread of COVID-19, Asians were conflated with Kung Flu and the China virus. Asian elders and Asian women in particular were subject to physical and verbal assault, violence, and murder. Asian Americans had been in the negative spotlight before that, but in a different way. Tu Tao, a Minneapolis police officer of Hmong descent, looked the other way while Derek Chauvin knelt on George Floyd's neck. It was George Floyd's murder that pushed Kyleen to examine systemic racism. I felt like I was starting from scratch, but I like spent all that summer and year like, digging into black history and just like educating myself on that but not actually like like on Asian Americans and stuff like that. Then Atlanta happened and all of a sudden it was us. Asian women were the victims. I was working at a little bakery. I like checked my phone. I remember seeing headlines saying there was a shooting but nobody didn't identify like who who 
I was like, okay, whoa, and then I get back to work. And then I had a couple of text messages from my friends that were, hey, just saw the shootings, want to check up on you. I'm thinking of you. I'm checking up on you. How are you doing? And I was like, what? Why? You know? And I was just so confused. Kylene went home and got herself caught up on the news and social media. The social media thing was crazy just to see people share stories and bring into light like what happened and just talking about Asians. That's just like something that hasn't really been done. It was just a crazy mix of emotions and overwhelm and also like in a way like grateful people were starting to care in a way, you know. Kyleen only had two Asian friends in Seattle and not a whole lot of people with whom she could turn to to help her process the hate crime. Kyleen approached a trusted work friend with whom she felt safe. I felt like she was like my mentor because she's been unraveling her blackness for much longer than me. And she's always just been like a safe person for me to talk about race. And I was like, I think I want to just organize a calling for Asian Americans to come together during this time because I, I felt like that's what I needed. I just really wanted to be surrounded by each other. Kyleen thought about the tools at her disposal. Bikes had been such an important part of her own empowerment and joy, but she felt so new to the bike community. I've never organized a ride. I've never, like, I don't have any experience or credibility or anything, you know. Like, I just, I'm very new to the bicycling community. I have, like, no network, basically. And so she was like, you just need to do it. Kyleen went home and scheduled a community bike ride. She looked at maps and planned a route through Gasworks Park in Fremont to Golden Gardens and Ballard. I was like, what is the most safest that we can do? I don't really know how to organize people through traffic. She quickly put up promotional flyers she threw together. It all happened fast. I called it a community ride, and it wasn't open to allies, but it was just for Asian Americans in this space. The ride took place just two days later. It was dry, but it was like a little chilly in March. Kyleen was super nervous about gathering a group of Asian-looking people together in public after the events in Atlanta. She felt uneasy about people's safety all morning. People were, like, sending me DMs. It was overwhelming because I didn't... There's all these, like, random people on the internet that I didn't know who they were. And I was like, who do I trust, you know? Because it was just, like, strangers. Kyleen turned to people in her trusted network who vetted and vouched for folks. And in an unexpected act of solidarity, BikeWorks showed up. BikeWorks is a nonprofit organization with a deep commitment to racial justice. They promote the bicycle as a vehicle for change and empowerment, and they are known for organizing rides. They all showed up. They're like, we do this for a job. <laughs> and how can we help? And I was like, oh, thank God. That also showed me how supportive the bicycling community is. Other people showed up like 40 people. BikeWorks helped split the crowd up into smaller, more manageable groups. They made sure each group had a leader, and they designated caboose riders to watch the group from the rear, keeping an eye on safety and ensuring that the group stayed together. I felt like a little chaotic. I was actually really stressed out, but then I think this is what we all feel like when we ride our bikes, but as soon as I got on my bike, all my stress just completely disappeared, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. The groups rode to Golden Gardens Park. The riders processed what they were feeling about the events of the week together. To close the ride, Kyleen gave a speech. Mainly I was like, the reason I started this or called for this ride was because I've been so ashamed of like who I was as an Asian American woman. And this is the first time I'm feeling proud of who I am. And this literally came out of this like personal journey of within myself that I've been suppressing and just like not bringing into the surface. And I think that's what made me tear up so much. Asian American identity is extremely complicated. Race is often understood as a black white binary. People assume Asians are white failing to realize that anti-Asian policies have required that our families assimilate in order to survive in hostile places. In that process, we've often lost the connection to our language, our cultures of origin, our homelands, and a critical sense of belonging. Those that rode that day expressed their gratitude for the gathering. One person came up to me and was like, today's my 40th birthday and I bailed on my birthday plans to come to this. 
and it was something that I didn't know that I needed. A lot of people shared they don't have a lot of Asian friends and they really just needed this. And I feel like because I was in the same need, somehow it was able to reach some people like that. Kylene felt the ground beneath her shift. People like her had come together out of mutual grieving and deep need for community. It was actually kind of like a monumental point in my life because I finally saw like what my purpose was. Her purpose, to use bikes to build community. So right after that, I went in for my shift to make scones. <laughs> and I worked till like, I don't know, like 1 a.m. or something. The rides have continued. These days, it's a monthly thing, more than just another bike club. They bike, take a break, make ramen, eat and share food, and then ride again. The group protects this space as an Asian American Pacific Islander space, because so few of these protected spaces exist. The club's members know this is something special. Ambersand Bike Club is so much more than just a bike club. It is a place where people with similar values can get together. The values of ABC are so strong in wanting to be a catalyst for liberation that it seeps into everything. It seeps into how we bike. It seeps into the beliefs that the org holds. It seeps into the community and how we treat each other and how we talk to each other. It seeps into how we intend to talk to each other, how we strive to move forward. If someone forgets food or water, we'll boil them boil water, boil noodles for whoever needs it. And it's a chance for me to care for others if I'm bringing extra food or water, but also a chance for me to be cared for. There's no ever expectation of me that to do these things. Um, it's just a chance for me to show the love and care I have for everyone, but also for me to receive the love and care I have for everyone. There's really no expectations for how you need to show up. It's a kind I, of radical acceptance. Yeah. And yeah. like, I think in a lot of other Asian spaces, there's a way you're expected to behave or to be or to know. I think part of what makes our group really special is that we don't have that. You just show up on your bike and bring some toppings to share with other people. And Ramen. if you don't come with anything, it doesn't matter. You are welcomed as family because yeah. food is so integral. It just like breaks this barrier down of like new people meeting each other yeah. for some reason you got like the marinated eggs the tofu and all of a sudden like you're everybody's best friend radical acceptance and safe space for asians means someone gets excluded namely white folks white folks have a really large community like there's just so many rides specifically that they can access freely and there's just something so different about Having a space for Asians, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islander. And so um, I think in the beginning, just like creating a space for that community and for those who identified. And so I just wanted to be very intentional about the people that we were serving. When I met you all, mm -hmm. it was because I was on the waterfront with some of my friends, Avon Kang and Jessica Kenny, who are a mixed race couple. Mm -hmm. Avon's Caribbean Canadian and uh, Jessica's, you know, not Asian. Mm -hmm. And so I, I saw like this big gang of 35, 40 Asian people on cycles rolling up. And I was like, what is this? Something is happening, <laughs> you know, and like Avon was like. Asian space and, <laughs> and like you know we just sat there and watched you all yeah. and then Jessica was like you know she engaged uh, one person in the group and was really curious about what you do how often you get together mm -hmm. and this person conveyed that it was uh, an Asian space and mm -hmm. I myself having a white partner I wouldn't be able to bring him and that's like mm -hmm. a, a complicated terrain to kind of navigate yeah. you know so yeah, yeah how, do, how do those conversations go? Anytime I've talked about the idea of opening it to white allies I've had push back from people inside and so I feel like I'm just trying to listen to what the people want and like making sure people know our values and our intentions because we're not here to just exist as another bike club we're so much more than that I want people to know that I think yeah. for a lot of people I think they might come with questions but mm -hmm. once they're actually like in this space yeah it makes sense Recently, ABC has expanded, inviting BIPOC and multiracial groups to join in on rides and ramen. The mutual support within each group expands out, and the communities empower each other. It's kind of like nerdy, but so special, and mm -hmm. I like loved yeah. being able to share that with them. 
And I feel like I'm shown what true community is and just genuine care for each other Mm -hmm. in our group. It's cultivated over time because of the people in it who, like, show so much care to the community. Bikes aren't just a mode of transportation. They're also tools of empowerment around which communities are built in Seattle, from groups like North Star Cycling, which exist to get melanated people on bikes outdoors, to Peace Peloton, which organizes bike rides that support Black-owned businesses. Bikes and bicycling culture in the Pacific Northwest have brought together communities in unexpected ways to engage with trauma, identity, and race. But that doesn't always mean it's heavy. Showing up for each other and lifting each other up um, is just something that I haven't found in a community before, Mm -hmm. of just being so like unabashedly joyful Mm. and giving so freely Mm -hmm. is something that I think a lot of people don't really have a good grasp on. Or a model. Yeah, a model for how that feels and what that looks like. In road bike racing, cyclists in a group conserve energy by riding close to other riders, slipstreaming behind others in a peloton. Together, they cut down on drag. Riders rotate their positions from front to back to front again to share recovery time. In this way... A group moves and leads together so that no one rider is overburdened. Kylene brings this approach to how she organizes Ampersand Bike Club. All the group's decisions are made collectively, including their structure, their mission, and what they call themselves as a group. My hope also like in the group as a culture is to like have just a very like transparent and open communication. Um where people can ask questions. Like, I want people to have these really, like, intentional, deep conversations asking us why and what we're doing. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been getting that so much from each member. And Mm -hmm. they feel comfortable asking me really hard questions. And I'd be like, oh, that's a great question. Let's dig into this more as a group. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we're always overthinking things, but it's really good (laughs) for the club to always reevaluate. I don't want to be surface level, basically. And we want to, built and cultivate authentic, genuine, transparent, vulnerable relationships Mm -hmm. with each other is my hope and to really feel like a family. Like being in community with strangers, riding a bicycle is also an act of vulnerability. Unlike a car, a bike is unprotected, exposed to the elements and to the dangers inherent to sharing the road with cars. Yet when we ride with a pack, we move together, aware of every other body, every other being in relationship to us, which keeps us moving forward, even when we think we can't bear to go any further. You can learn more about the Ampersand Bike Club. Just go to our show notes. Next week's object is a voice. 10,000 Things is produced by KOW in Seattle. Our host, writer, and creator is me, Shin Yi Pai. Whitney Henry Lester produced this episode. Jim Gates is our editor. The show art is designed by Eason Yang. Original music is by Tomo Nakayama. Our production team includes Michaela Giannotti, Hans Twight, and Brendan Sweeney. Partial funding of the Blue Suit was made possible by a Hope Corps grant from the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Special thanks to the Windrose Fund for their financial support. If you like this podcast, KEOW has a lot more great audio for you. Search KEOW in your podcast app and see what piques your interest. Thanks for listening. At SoundSide, we bring you news and conversation rooted in the Pacific Northwest. Hi, I'm Libby Denkman. I think of my job hosting SoundSide as, number one, asking tough questions of powerful people, the questions you, KUOW listeners, want answered. And two, bringing you a daily slice of the fascinating, confounding, and often goofy side of life in Washington State. Join me for SoundSide at noon and 8 p.m. on KUOW or anytime on the SoundSide podcast.